Amen and amen. That's the Cameron family, two sisters and a nephew. Their parents and grandfather was here last night, and uh, he is a wonderful man of God, he and his wife. And uh, he used to open up for all of the old country singers all over America. And so when these girls came to church here, I said, listen, do y'all sing like your daddy sings? We have. And here they are. And praise the Lord for that. What a beautiful, beautiful song. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Our focal verses will be verses 6 through 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. And what we're going to do today, we're going to conclude a series that we've been doing through the month of May. And it's called Fighting for Your Family. And today we'll close it by saying fighting your, for your family while you can. And we want to identify who our family is. Now, all of you know biologically who your mother, dad, and who your brothers and sisters are. But the Bible teaches us something beyond that. And we want to include a family that is greater than your biological family. It is the family of God. You have been blessed to be chosen. You've been blessed to become a royal nation and a, and a priesthood and people who are blessed uh, in ways that we never dreamed possible by the, by the power of our God. And so we want to be that family, and we want to do what we're allowed to do by the grace of God, in the will of God, while we can do those things. And so it says in the scripture in Matthew chapter 12, just hold your place in 2 Timothy, we're coming there. In Matthew chapter 12, it says, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, all those who were his followers in that room that night. Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And so what God speaks of in your personal life is that you are blessed to be a part of the family of God. And what a great blessing that is. And the more that you live on this earth, the more you're going to realize that God has privileged you with opportunities to relate to people who are very special in your life. And, and some of them will be here with you in a worship service today. Some of them may live in other parts of the country or the world some of them may have been an active part and encourager in your life in days gone by, but you look back and you realize God has strategically positioned you to be a person who can fight not only for your personal family, but for the family of God and do it while you have the opportunity to do it. And so the Apostle Paul, when we go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is no longer given the privileges of house arrest under the Roman Empire. He had that for a while. He could do his writings. He could receive anybody he wanted to. He had a guest house where people could come and visit with him. And then things changed in the world in which he lived. And everybody thought the world was coming to an end immediately in the Roman Empire because a new emperor came on the scene, and his name was Nero. And Nero was one of the most paranoid, schizophrenic nut jobs you've ever seen in your life. And he rose to be the emperor of Rome, and he was killing everybody around him because he was suspicious of them. And then he torched the city of Rome and blamed, had a public relations campaign, we will blame the Christians for this problem. And once we get the blame placed upon them, we will begin to wipe out all Christians. We will persecute them. And so Paul changed from house arrest to being placed in what was called a maritime prison outside of the city limits of Rome. And to get into that prison, the only way you could go down, it was a cavern, a cave, and you would be lowered down by ropes. And when your feet hit the rocks down in the bottom, you needed to realize something, you would never see the light of day again. You were there until you were executed, or you were there until you died, most likely of starvation, at the hands of the Romans. And so here is the setting of where our scripture comes from today, and this is what Paul will say to a young man whose name is Timothy. And he's going to reveal to him that he's got a, a challenge for his life, a charge for his life. And so if you would, back up with me to verse 1. And we'll get to verses 6 through 8. He says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in the view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word of God. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time is coming, he says, 
that's going to happen in this world that men will not put up with sound doctrine instead to suit their own desires they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear they'll turn from the truth and their ears away from the truth and they'll turn aside to myths but you are to keep your head in all situations you're to endure hardship and do the work of an evangelist share the gospel of Jesus Christ and discharge all the duties of your ministry and here is our scripture for I am being poured out I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time has come for my departure time out right there if you study Jewish folk folklore if you study the traditions of Judaism after they have sacrificed sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice on the altar and you smell the sweet incense of, of, of meat being grilled on an altar after they've done all the sacrifice and it's time for the sacrifice to end the last thing the priest will do he will bring forth what is called libations libations would be something you gave that you produced and it would be the wine that you made in your vineyard and you would bring your wine and the last of the gifts given on the sacrifice would be poured out just like that wine on that altar and you would hear the and then the smell would be added to the sweetness of the meat and the spices that were on the meat and then the smell of the sweetness of the wine would be recognized and that would be the last thing that would go up into the presence of God Paul says something we don't understand my life is that libation the last of my sacrifice is about to take place the time of my departure is at hand now watch what he says this ought to become the creed of your life and I'm not a person who preaches uh, things of men or creeds but I, I like this saying right here and I say this to a lot of young people when I counsel with them and talk with them but he says this for I'm already being poured out like a libation a drink offering as a sacrifice unto the Lord and in the time of my last thing that I'm gonna do on this earth is at hand my departure is coming I have fought the good fight if the Lord were to ask you the question today answer that question to me Cliff, have you fought a good fight? Do you know what I pray every single week of my life? Lord, forgive me if I fail to do the things that you intended for me to do this week. Have you fought a good fight? Let the Lord speak to your heart. Let the Holy Spirit reveal to you if there's room, like Brother Cliff, for improvement in your life as a servant unto God. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I am not yet through I want y'all to know that I don't know why when you start getting Social Security and you got Medicare everybody thinks you're washed up I'm not I'm still here today and so I have more people across Hattiesburg when are you going to retire I told one lady and she wants me to retire I told one lady I'm not you're just gonna work all your life yeah may not be in the same role I'm in but I will never stop being a servant of God now, for those of you who are retired, praise the Lord. I envy you. And I'm going to become some like you in the days to come. But what Paul is saying is, hey, for me, the race is done. What God ordained me to do on this earth is just about completed. And your day will come for that too. Our departure will come. I finished the race, and here's the last one. I have kept the faith. Fight the good fight. Finish your race. Keep the faith. And no matter what happens in the world around us, keep your faith. Keep your focus on the presence of the Lord and allow Him to soothe your soul. Allow Him to give you encouragement. Allow Him to share His hope for all eternity through your life. And always remember that God expects us to do that. Keep the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only but unto all of those also who love his appearing. And so here Paul is, he's like a father to the family of faith, and he has carried the gospel across the known world, and all of a sudden the gospel is exploding everywhere, but yet his time to live his last moment on this earth will come, not by his will, but by Nero. Nero will execute the apostle Paul. He's trying to wipe out the influence of Christianity. And it's so funny, as the Roman Empire, this great Roman Empire, ruled the world with an iron hand, with a scepter that says, Rome is the, is the place. We are the ones. The Romans control the world. 
And you know what's going to happen in just a few years after Paul's martyrdom? You're going to have a young general whose name is Constantine. He's going to come on the scene in history. And there's going to be four generals. There's a void in leadership in the Roman Empire. And there's going to be four generals that people are saying, well, if it were up to me, Constantine would be the one. And so there was a little battle between these generals. And Constantine came out victorious. And Constantine marched into the city of Rome, the victor. And he was made the emperor of Rome. Now let me tell you what one person can do. This is the power of influence of you by yourself. His mother prayed for him every day of his life. His mother, Helena, was a queen. His mother, Queen Helena, was a Christian. And she prayed for her son. And when he rose to power, he comes to his mother. He says, Mom, how could I honor you for all that you've done for me and what you have meant to me? You know what she wanted to do? I want to go to the land of the Bible. I want to see where my Savior walked. I want to go to the places where things happen. And many of the sites in Israel today were identified in 300 plus A.D. by Queen Hulina because of the gift of her son sending her to the Holy Land. And all of these sites were preserved. And have you ever heard of this church? It's a little bitty church in the world. It's called a Roman Catholic Church. She was the one who identified and claimed those for the church. Back then, Catholic meant universal. The, all the children of God belonged to the family of God. And so she identified those sites. And so she played a significant role of influence in her life. Now you say, Brother Cliff, I don't know if one of my children will ever be president of the United States. Maybe, maybe they will. We, we may need some help in that area. I don't know if my children will ever be a senator or, or, or a congressman. Maybe they will, and maybe we need some help in that area. But who knows what influence you may have. On Thursday night, no, Friday night, uh, Joey and I went to Brandon. A lady named Sarah McCann, a realtor up there, had passed away. She called me years ago, and she said, Are you Cliff Lasme? Yes, I am. The only one that I know of right now. Do you take people to Israel? Yes, I do. I want to go with you. You're welcome to. When's the next trip? Next year in February. What do I need to do? Send a deposit. She sent two deposits. The second one for, was for her daughter, Beverly. And Beverly and her mother went on the Israel journey, a pilgrimage to Israel. And we're there. She's a realtor. Beverly is a hospital administrator in Dayton, Ohio. And Beverly's a sweet lady. And so we get to know everybody on our group. You become like a family as you travel across for all of those days in the Holy Land. And at the end of the journey, to tell you what one influence can do in life, at the end of our journey, we're about ready to go to the Ben-Gurion Airport and head back to the United States. We always pick a restaurant somewhere. There's a very nice restaurant, and we have a little last supper together. And anybody wants to say something can say something. Our guide will share what, you know, he's learned and, and his appreciation for the group. And so we're being seated, and this was a big group. We, we usually carry anywhere around 30 to 40. On this group, we had 80-something. We had two buses. And so we're, we're there, and the restaurant we're in is crowded. And so Joey and I sat down with our pastor friend and wife, Tony and Sherry Lambert, who are leading the other part of the group, and we sat down together, and then we have a boy that's been like a son to us, and many of you know him. He, he was a part of this church for years, Raymond Swartz, a little boy, you know, about six foot five, works offshore. And so Raymond was like a son to us, and so he sat with us. There were six places at that table. Here's the influence you may have in life. And watch what happens here. Here comes Beverly, the hospital administrator from Dayton, Ohio. And there's one seat open. She's with her mother, Sarah McCann, who we just went to honor this past week. And she says to her mother, Mom, here's one seat. I'm going to take it. And you can go upstairs with the rest of the group. And her mother stands there looking like this. Well, her mother didn't know her mother was being an influence in her daughter's life. Her mother told me, I'm praying for my daughter. I'm praying for her to get involved in the things of the Lord. I'm praying for her to be in the will of God. Well, her prayers were being answered on the Israel trip. Because every night I would go down and check the lobby, make sure all our group's okay. I'd see people in the lo lobby. They're down there drinking coffee or might have been drinking Hebrew wine. And so I would check on them, y'all okay, you need anything? And then I would go up and go to bed. 
And every night I go down, all the young people on the tour, they're in that lobby. They're down there laughing, hooting, and hollering, having the time of their life. And then there is Beverly and Raymond sitting way back in the corner where nobody can see them. I didn't say anything. Next night, there they are, back over here in this corner of this lobby. And at the end of the trip, she comes in. I'm sitting here, Mom. And so, long story short, at a Perry Central North Forest baseball game, which would have been in 2007, we're, we're over there. My son was a senior that year. And we're playing baseball. We won. That was the last game. We're driving home. And Raymond is with me, Joanne, and my daughter. He's sitting in the right seat. His phone rings. Now, I had been noticing this. He's always at our house if he's not offshore, and his phone would ring, and he would get up and walk out on the patio and stand out there for two hours. Now, you know what? We're, we're sharp people. Something's happening. And so the phone rings. Raymond's phone is laying in the center console. I said, let me answer that for you. I picked it up. I said, hello, babe. She said, hello. It was her. I said, look, let's cut the mustard. Let's get married. Okay. <laughs> I handed it to Ray Raymond. I said, it's all yours, buddy. <laughs> They're married today. When we went through the, through the visitation line, I told Beverly's sister and her brother and her brother-in-law and her dad, I told them that story. I said, this lady in this casket made a difference in somebody's lives for the will of God to be accomplished. Now watch what I'm going to tell you here. And I won't keep you long today. How, how do I live the life that God wants me to live and fight for my family and do so in a matter while I can? God, what would you have me to do? And I'm going to say three words to you today, and they're found in the Scripture. I'm not going to read them. They may be put up on the board there. But the first one God wants you to do when you know that you're a part of something special, a family, whether your personal family or the family of God. And can I tell you something? You people are special to me as the family of God. I love you. I cherish you. And, and I, I'm privileged to be a part of your life. And I rejoice in our journey together. And I think the Lord wants us to enjoy ourselves in that journey. I, I believe he gives us joy. He says, I will show you the path of life. And my presence is joy beyond measure. And in my right hand are pleasures forevermore. Your life should not be a miserable life as a child of God. And so as we go together, find the place where the joy of the Lord floods your soul and the pleasures of God become a reality as a part of his will for your life. And so here we are as we look at this, we see in Luke chapter 15 the greatest story of the family and celebration. It's the story of the prodigal son. You know what the prodigal son did? He left his home. He said, I'm tired of this boring life. Father, give me my part of the inheritance, and I'm going to go, and I'm, I'm headed for Las Vegas, wherever that was in the land of the Bible. I want to go where something's happening. And he did, and he lost all of his money. He lost everything. He's feeding pigs. He comes to himself, and he says, listen, my, the servants at my father's house, they're, they're better off than I am. I'm going to rise up. I'm going to tell God, I'm sorry, God. I made a big mistake here. But if you'll just help me get home, I'm going to go to my father, and I'm going to say, I have sinned against God, heaven, and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. If you would, just let me come back and work as a hired servant. All I'm asking for is a bed to sleep in and food to eat every day. That's all I want. And the father sees him coming. Celebration. He sees him coming, and he runs to him. Hebrew men in public did not run in public. That meant you were out of control. If you ever see Brother Cliff running on the side of the road, it's not because I'm jogging. It's not because I'm out there jogging. It's because somebody is after me. Stop and help me out. Now, I have to say this, time out. I have been working on getting some weight off. You know, when I got back from my motorcycle trip, I weighed, and it was one of those, oh, my gosh, moments. I've eaten my way since last Thanksgiving through that day, and it was going upward. And so I told Joy, and I said, look, I, I'm fixing to go the other way. So this morning, I hit 16 pounds off. You know, that's not a lot. I come in the back door. When I pull in the parking lot, I see John King, security, standing under the drive through and I see him with a cup of coffee in one hand and looked like a piece of cake he was eating in the other hand. What I said to myself was, Barbara Hudson is already here. She brings cakes and puts out there. 
And so I saw John eating that cake. I come in the back door, and Barbara hollers from the coffee area, Brother Cliff, are you still on a diet? Yes, ma'am. Can't you tell? I cannot lie in the house of God. That's what she told me this morning. That is not good encouragement, Miss Barbara. And so here, when, when they did this, he sees his son coming, he runs to him, and then he says these famous words, and, and it's just kind of briefly, he said, hey, quick, it's in the scripture, quick, bring a, our best robe, put it on him, bring a ring, put it on his finger, bring sandals, put them on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it, watch these words, very words out of scriptures, let's have a feast and celebrate. And you say, well, Brother Cliff, what does the celebration look like? Well, last night... I was at a wedding and almost didn't get back to church to preach last night. Last night I was wedding, it was my niece's wedding at Raspberry Green, up here in the middle of nowhere, somewhere between here and northern Jones County and Smith County. And so uh, let, me tell you, let me tell you what is added to the story. When the older son comes and they're having the party, when the barbecue is already in full swing, and the older son comes, and you tell me if this is not in your word of God, he heard music, Music is a celebration. And he heard this, dancing. Now Martha says quit picking on her, and I'm not going to do it. And so I'm not going to pick on her, but how do you celebrate with your family? Maybe it's a time where you do something special that everyone comes together and it's, it's very pleasurable and enjoyable. Let me give you the definition of celebration and see if you can remember this. To mark a happy occasion. How do I do that? It says to frequent with large numbers. So, hey, everybody, it's a party. Come on. Everybody wants to come. Come. And I don't know who sent out the invitations for a wedding last night, but they had three times more people than I think they thought were coming. It was huge. And so it says to frequent with great numbers, to honor, to commemorate, to remember things that are special in your life. Just like all of you who had seniors or kindergartners that graduated from kindergarten. And you're celebrating, you're remembering, hey, we're moving forward in this life. You commemorate that time. And also to give public praise to mark this happy occasion by engaging in pleasurable activity. And so what we need in our families today is not doom and gloom, which we have plenty of. We need some celebrations in our family today. We need celebrations in the family of God today where we can rejoice with one another and be glad together and give hope and encouragement to one another. And, and so how, what would it take this week for God to say, listen, let me tell you how I want you to keep the faith. Let me tell you how I want you to fight the fight. Let me tell you how to finish strong, learn to celebrate with God in the journey of life. My daughter is a school teacher, and it's, it tickles me. People want to know what your children do. Brother Cliff, what do your children do? And I know you're thinking that too, and I'll tell you. Uh, my son uh, is, a, is an accountant, a CPA, with cooperative energy. And my daughter is a school teacher. I had a lady the other day say, what does she teach? I said, she teaches history. That was her main subject in college. And she also teaches Spanish. Now, for some reason, people look at you funny when you say a, a foreign language. And you're going to say, Brother Cliff, do you speak Spanish? I've got about seven words. I've known them ever since we've been on the mission trips down in Central America back in the 1990s. And so, yeah, I've got a few words, but no, I don't speak Spanish. But I said, my daughter teaches Spanish. The lady that used to teach at North Forest High School before Casey became the, my daughter became the Spanish teacher, her name was Florence Carlson, Flo Carlson. She's a Methodist. She'd lead music at all the Methodist churches around Hattiesburg. She was a school teacher, and she was a person who you couldn't take the smile off her face. She went with us on mission trips down to Central America. She went with us to Israel, and everywhere she was, she's glowing. And this is what she would say to her Spanish class, and I saw some who were here last night evidently took Spanish from her. She would stand up before them, and let me see if I can get this right. I can never remember. Vamos a celebre. You know what that means? Let's celebrate. She would say that, and she'd begin to clap her hand. And all the class would go crazy. Let's celebrate. And so Florence has gone home to be with the Lord, but I'll always remember her. Everywhere she went, there was a spirit of celebration in her heart. 
And she brings back pleasant, commemorative memories to so many people. Maybe you need to start doing that a little bit. What would it take for you to celebrate with your family this week? What do you need to do? Can I tell you what you need to do? You need to tell your children, your brothers, your sisters, your moms, your dad, whoever your relatives are, you need to tell them that you love them. You celebrate the greatest gift ever given, the love of God that's in your soul given by the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's celebrate. And all of a sudden, you become contagious to people. Hey, I need that in my life rather than all the Eeyores walking through life. I've done... I've done so many sermons in different churches, and it was funny. You, they're sizing you up the first sermon. When you come in to lead a conference or a revival in a church, they're looking at you, sizing you up. Well, we're sizing you up. And, and here's what, I can't ever say this to anybody else. Here's what I used to think in my mind. They're sitting there thinking, go ahead. Make my day. See if you can make me smile or laugh. And I'm thinking to myself, well, some of them, there's no possible way. <laughs> God says, celebrate with your family. Ask God to show you how to do that. Joanne and I told her in Bible study the other morning after we prayed together, I said, let me tell you what we're going to do. I like that finish the race part. Let's finish strong. Let's start going and celebrating with people. And, and we used to do this all the time, and we don't do it as much anymore. We'd go to people's homes. And we just, we'd go in and sit down and talk with them and visit with them and enjoy the pleasures of life together. And uh, as my role becomes less in my older years, that role is going to become greater in my older years. I want to be an encourager for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to help people be able to say, while I can, I will do what the Lord calls me to do. Number two, after celebrate, let's challenge our family. There's a scripture that may go up on your screen. It comes from John 21. It's where Jesus challenged and restored one of his closest family members, Peter the apostle. And after Peter had denied the Lord Jesus Christ, then they go to a place by the Sea of Galilee, and they're going to have a meal together. And this place is called today, it's called Peter's Primacy. And it's a little bitty chapel church right down by the seaside, just above Magdala on the Sea of Galilee. And, and out is, the, is a little area where you can walk out onto the shore of Sea of Galilee. And it's, it's some sand, but a lot of rocks there. But you'll see group after group after group from all around the world, you'll see them coming and standing by that seashore there. Now, what, is, what does promise mean? Peter, the primary purpose of your life is to do what the Lord has called you to do. And today, I'm going to restore you into a position to fulfill the will of God in your personal life. And this is of the utmost primary importance in your life. Peter's primacy. Years ago, I don't remember if it was the Dominicans or, or a branch of the Catholic Church that came to that area once people were allowed to come back to Israel after they were formed as a nation in 1948. There was a group that came there and they brought in three huge stones. And they placed those stones just below that little chapel that was built right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And so for years, I walked by, and you would see those stones, stone, 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 the big three. And then one day I stopped, and I was looking at those stones, and I asked our guy, I said, what? why are these stones here? He said, well, look closely and tell me what you see. And see, I'm not good at art. All people say, what do you see? I don't know what I see. And so I'm looking at these stones, and all of a sudden I catch it in one that's been walked on by millions of people, and it looks like it's in the shape of a heart. And so Peter challenges, Jesus challenges Peter. Sometimes you got to challenge your family. Peter, I need to say something to you because you denied me three times. What do you need to say to me, Lord? Peter, do you love me? He knew where that was coming from. Yes, Lord, I love you. Second time, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Third time, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. And it grieves my soul that you asked me the third time. I'm going to say to you one more time, yes, I love you. Now, you don't have time for this, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. We've been doing a study on Wednesday nights about the Holy Spirit. It's been really good. And, and Ray read books from Pentecostals, books from Protestants, and he's trying to lay out the scripture of what it says to have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in you if you're a child of God. And he fills you continually, daily. 
It's an ongoing process. And so here's the beautiful thing. When Peter responded to the Lord's question, Jesus said, and this is Mr. Ray, the language scholar. I got this from him. He shared this one time. When he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? The word love there was agape, the greatest love of all. The love that is the characterization of the holiness and the presence of God. Peter, do you love me with all this within you? Peter answered, yes, Lord, I phileo you. I love you. What is phileo? Philadelphia, brotherly love. Not the highest love, not agape. Jesus asked him a second time, Peter, do you agape me? This is in the language. Do you agape? You love me more than anything with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. And then he asked him the third time, Peter, do you agape love me? No, Jesus said the third time, Peter, do you phileo me? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. Brought it down to a standard where Peter was with a broken heart because of his failure his sin in his life of denying the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's what I don't have time to show you. But what's going to happen in just a few days? Pentecost is coming. Fifty days after the celebration of the Passover fleet, uh, free, uh, feast, we're set free. God brought freedom to our souls. Fifty days, Penta, 50, Pentecost. Bring your first fruit. Bring me the best you got. And on that day, the Holy Spirit came and fill the hearts of men, women, and children who were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all of a sudden, what Peter was not capable of doing, at Peter's primacy, the Spirit would come into him, and he would preach the greatest sermon ever preached. And he would scorch the nation of Israel, and he would torch the light of the presence of the holiness of God through the Holy Spirit that had come to dwell in the hearts of man. And all of a sudden, things are moving up a grade in life. What Peter couldn't do in the flesh, he could now do. And I guarantee you, he was telling everybody everywhere he went, can I tell you something? I agape love my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Every ounce of my being is surrendered and yielded and committed to him because I love him. And he's restored my soul. And so what God wants to do in our life, as we do with our children, sometimes we've got to challenge them. We got to say, do you think that's good? Well, yeah, I think it's good. What about you, Dad? No, I don't think that's that. I don't think that's good. And so you begin to challenge. You begin to take on that role that you want people to be in the position to do the will of God that He wants them to do. And one of the things is what He's saying is, Peter, do this. Feed my sheep. Do what the Holy Spirit is going to lead you to do in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and nurturing spiritually the souls of people who are hurting on the inside that can be cleansed and forgiven by the presence of God that wants to come into their life. Go out and share this with the world. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Now watch what he's saying, the key to it. Do it, Peter, while you can. You've been given this privileged opportunity and the presence and the anointing of God is upon your life. So do this while you can do it. And don't worry about what others are doing. Do what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Stop worrying about what everybody else is doing in church. And start saying, Lord, Holy Spirit, fill me. Guide me. Use me. Direct me. And let me do what you're telling me to do. Friday morning, before we went to Brandon to a funeral home Friday night, we went down to Poplarville to Spring Hill Baptist Church. Some dear friends of ours, their father had passed away, 92 years old, D.O. Stanford in Pearl River County. D.O. is one of the most humble, godly men I've ever known in my life. And so I've been telling Joanne, you know, I, I, I try not to say this in front of you because you're bragging, but uh, last weekend was my weekend where I said yes to the Lord to surrender my life to ministry, to sell my insurance business, and to ruin my wife's life because she had to leave where she was. And so that was 40 years ago last weekend. So I've been telling Joy, you know, I've been doing this 40 years. I've been doing this 40 years. At the graveside of one of the most humble, faithful servants of God who was serving the Lord until he died, 92 years old. The, the pastor that led the graveside service after the inside service was named Brother Nippers. 
And Sandy Cameron remembered him from Pearl River. He used to be the speech teacher at Pearl River Community College. And so Brother Nippers was pastor at one time of Spring Hill Baptist Church way before I was. And so they asked Brother Nippers to come back. And he got under that tent, and I wanted to help him to say, you're going too long. It's hot. You know, I'm sitting there thinking like you people, oh, my gosh, how long have we got to stay here? And it was hot. The sun is beaming down. And Brother Nippers, did a, he did a, a wonderful job. He just took way too long to do it. And don't tell him I said that, and I hope he doesn't see this on Facebook. But Brother Nippers said this statement. I'm sitting there, and he says, I'm holding Joanne's hand. And, man, I mean, my ball spot is hot. We've, we've been there for 15 minutes. And he's given the history of life. And then he says, in just a moment, boy, I hate when preachers do it. I'm going to share a scripture with you and a message. And I'm thinking to myself, what? We've been here forever. Go ahead and spit it out and say amen. And let us get out of this heat. So I'm holding my wife's hand. And when he says, in a moment, I'm going to share a scripture and a message with you, I just squeeze Joanne's hand. She smiles. Then he said this, and I'm so honored and privileged to still be here. I've been in the ministry for 66 years, and here's what my wife did. <laughs> 40 years, 66 years. Why you can, do what the Lord tells you to do. And don't worry about what anybody else does. Do what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. And watch the blessings and the results and the influence of what you do. Last one, let's close. Celebrate your family, challenge your family, cherish your family. I heard on Caleb coming home from the funeral last night, I heard a man say, hey, what can you do to bless other people? And who do you know that has blessed you? And the radio disc jockey, and I don't know who he is. He said, and if you don't know anybody that has been a blessing, you step up and be the blessing. I thought, wow. Then he goes further. He said, let me tell you what a 10-year-old little girl did. Her grandmother has dementia. She's in the hospital. She doesn't really know the family members. And they had a recording of this little 10-year-old girl going in and singing the song in Jesus' name to her grandmother. And the grandmother turned and smiled and looked at her. If a 10-year-old can help us understand, cherish the privilege to do what you can when you can, we ought to be able to discern that from the Lord. And so the Lord may say, hey, don't miss these beautiful times. And so in the scripture, we find that God teaches us while we're doing the will of God and loving people, we cherish that opportunity because God says this opportunity is only going to come once in a while. And so I'm thinking, and that, that comes from Acts chapter 15, where Paul says to Barnabas, let's go back and let's encourage all of the new believers where we started churches all across the world. And Barnabas said, man, that's a great idea. Let's go back and rejoice with them and, and share the word with them and see how they're doing. And Barnabas says this, okay, I'm going to bring Mark with me. And Paul said, no, I, I don't think so. Why not? Well, you remember, he went with us on the first missionary journey. He didn't make it but to one place, Pamphylia, and he quit. And he went home, and so he, he's not going with us. Barnabas, the encourager, is. He said, well, yeah, I think he should. No, he's not. And so it was such a sharp disagreement, they decided to split ways. And Barnabas said, I tell you what, you go on, and then I'll go on. And I'm going to take Mark with me. And watch this. And Paul, you take Silas. And we'll split up and be two teams instead of one. And they agreed on that. And so they do that. Now, after Mark had quit, how, how does Mark feel when Paul, the apostle Paul says, hey, I, I don't want you on my team. I'm not going to give you a position of leadership and service and honor to the Lord because you, you quit. And, you know, there's a lot of us who may at times quit on God. Maybe we're not as available as we should be. Maybe we're not doing what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do as we should. And maybe we just kind of wander away like the prodigal. And the Lord says when you've got the family of God together, you need to cherish those moments. And so here, as we begin to learn to cherish those moments, we see what happens when the people of God come together and work together. And, and I'll close with this scripture in just a moment. We're leaving the church Friday. 
walking out to the tent in the cemetery, and there's a big crowd there. The church was packed full for a wonderful man of God, Dio Stanford. And a young lady ahead of us turns around, sees us, comes walking back, and her name was Angela Powell when she was a, a little girl growing up in the Spring Hill community. And she walks up to my wife and throws her arms around her and said, I love you so much, and I have missed you so much. First time we'd seen some of those people in 34 years. And she's telling my wife how much she loved her. And then Joanne, we're, we're walking right by the little parsonage of Spring Hill. And Joanne says, we ought to go right through that door right there. And you know what we ought to do? And the girl said, let's have a tea party. We had a little two-year-old girl named Casey at that time. And those two sisters from down the road, Faye, Faye Powell's children, Curtis Powell's children, they would walk up that hill every day. And they'd come and look in the glass of our storm door. And they would come to see Casey. And Miss Joanne would have a tea party with them every day. And, and Casey would go to that little window, that window, and she would say this. She'd look out the window, and the other one that came right behind the sister was Lisa, the other one, Angela and Lisa. And our daughter couldn't pronounce their names separate, but they always came together. And they always had a tea party together. And my daughter would stand there with her hands on that glass. Angelisa, Angelisa, Angelisa. She's looking for him. When God gives you an opportunity to show up, when God gives you an opportunity to fellowship and love one another and encourage one another, don't miss that opportunity. Cherish that privilege that God has put before his people and become actively involved in creating those moments in your life. And we come together and we cherish those times. And there's so many things that God will do when his blessings begin to flow because we truly love and share and care with one another and we spend time together, you can't stop the blessings from flowing. And let me show you what happened at the end of the story in the scripture we just read from, 2 Timothy chapter 4, down in verse 9, the next scripture says, do your best to come to me quickly. This is Paul to young Timothy, the minister. For Demas... Because he has forsaken me, for he has loved this world. He's deserted me, and he's gone to Thessalonica. No cherished time there. He's disappeared. And then he said, and this is not a bad situation, and Titus has gone to Dalmatia, and Crescens has gone to Galatia. Everybody's gone. There's nobody here but me and Luke. Just old Luke. That'd be like you saying the only person here, that's me. Kathy said, hey, there's nobody here but Tim, her husband. Nobody else is here, just Tim's here. How does that make Tim feel? And so here we begin to see the beauty of fellowship and gathering together and cherishing our moments together. And so keep reading with me. The good is coming. Only Luke is with me. Get who? Mark. I, I don't have anything to do with Mark, and Mark doesn't have anything to do with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Last words were being said. Bring on Mark and let's celebrate together and cherish our love for the Lord Jesus Christ and let's love one another. There's sometimes in your life when people disappear and maybe you need to do a little... Holy Spirit guided action to say, hey, I want you to know I love you. Maybe we could come together, and when you do get together, you see the sweetness of the fellowship and the glory of God and the blessings of God. And let me tell you what to do. Don't miss this. Cherish that time. I've been in churches before I became a minister. And I have seen the anointed power and presence of God bringing souls to salvation, creating a bond of love like I've never known in my life other than in the presence of the Lord. And then I've seen that end abruptly, quickly, and it become dead as a doornail. If God is moving in your life, as God has been blessing your life, do what you can while you can. Learn to dance. Celebrate in life. Learn to be faithful and cherish the moments. Delight 
and the privileges that you have with other people. And always remember this, God loves people. Crowning work of creation. God loves people more than anything. Where should my passion be? And my love for the Lord, Lord, teach me to love people more than anything. And may the Lord bind us together and may we fight for our family and may we cherish and delight in the times and may we do it while we can. I don't know what the Lord will tell you this morning, but I guarantee you if you'll open your heart to him, the Holy Spirit will give guidance into your life of things you may need to do. I've already told you one of the things me and Joanna are fixing to start doing. I said, we're going to start setting aside a half a day and we're going to go fellowship with some people. You may not know we're coming. She's already made plans. We have some friends who not long ago got a home and they're excited about it. And she said, we're going to get a gift and we're going to go surprise them and say we, we rejoice with them. And so see what the Holy Spirit tells you to do and then don't dread it, enjoy it. And some of the greatest treasures of your life will be revealed through us being the family of God, that God has called us to be and fighting for what we need to fight for. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer?